let's talk a little bit about the practical side of eating in Europe. Here are some tips for how Europeans do things a little bit differently than we do, sort of the practicalities of European uh, food experience. Uh, the first thing that a lot of Americans get a little confused by is the word menu. Uh, you may know that in a lot of countries in Europe, if you go into a restaurant and you ask for a menu, they're not going to give you the list of what you can order. They're going to assume you want the fixed price meal, because in most countries in Europe, that's what a menu refers to. If you want the bill of fare, if you want a list of what you can order, that's usually some word similar to carte. So it's la carta in Spain, uh, it's la carte in France, it's speisekarte in German. Um, so don't walk into a restaurant and be confused if you ask for a menu and they're not quite sure what to make of it. Uh, speaking of those menus, however, uh, these fixed price meals, those can be a great way to get a nice survey of the local cuisine. And often uh, a good restaurant will have several levels of their menu. So you can get a basic menu for one price, but if you want to get a little bit more interesting and have a little higher quality ingredients, you can actually go up a little bit in quality. The other thing to be aware of in different European countries is that the way that uh, Europeans organize their meals can be different. The way that they lay out the order of courses can be different. So as an example, let me talk about uh, an Italian meal. A traditional big Italian meal actually involves four different courses. You have the antipasti or the appetizers. That would be something like, uh, you know, uh, marinated vegetables. Then you have the primi, okay, the primo piatto, the first course. That's usually a pasta or a soup. Then you have the secundi uh, or the secondo. Uh, that's a main course, usually meat or fish. And the final court is dessert. Uh, this sounds like a pretty rigid structure, but honestly, most Italians don't eat every course. You look at this and say, geez, do I have to order all four courses? Not necessarily. Uh, I had a friend who told me, an Italian friend, I said, how many courses is it polite to order? I don't want to feel like I'm cheaping out. And they said, well, really, as long as you order two courses per person, that's fine. And sharing is usually okay. So if I'm in an Italian restaurant with my wife, uh, we might order two pastas and a main course and dessert. So that's two courses per person, four courses total, and that's just fine. Uh, by the way, uh, Italian chefs are fanatic about your digestion. Uh, and this is something else that's a, a little different than the way we think about food. Uh, but European chefs really, especially in Italy, really lose sleep over your digestion and making sure that there's a proper order, there's a proper progression for the different courses of food. Here's an example. Um, very traditionally, if you order a big meal, including a salad, the salad is going to come after the pasta at a traditional restaurant. At a touristy restaurant, they know you're an American, so they'll probably bring it out at the beginning or they'll ask you. But if you go to a very traditional restaurant, they assume you want the pasta first, then the salad because it creates a nice little buffer in your stomach between the pasta and the meat that you're about to eat. Uh, I once went to a very traditional restaurant in Florence and I ordered a salad and a pasta and the pasta came and I thought, well, I guess they forgot about the salad and then after the pasta, here comes the salad. And I didn't have another course coming, but that was just the order that they did things in. Um, so be aware, it's not because they're being stubborn, it's not because they're trying to confuse you, it's simply that they believe that's the proper way to ingest food. There is a proper order to these things. There's a proper water to drink with different kinds of food. You don't want mineral water for every food or you don't want bubbles for every food. Um, just be aware of that. And in general, European chefs frown on substitutions. This is, I think, a, a big cultural difference with the United States. Um, I think in a lot of uh, cases, Americans go to a restaurant and we assume the customer is always right. I know what food I want. I know how I want it. Europeans go to a restaurant and say, no, I'm putting myself in the hands of an expert. The chef knows the right way to make the food. So if you go to an American restaurant and say, can I have the side from this meal with the main from this meal? They'll say, sure, I'll ask the chef. I'm sure it's fine. Uh, Europeans, they might actually kick you out for asking that question. Um, the chef designed everything together for a reason. That's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, so just sort of, it requires an attitude adjustment sometimes to understand where they're coming from. I mentioned earlier about sharing courses in an Italian restaurant. And you know, uh, Rick Steves personally and all of us here, we're big fans of sharing courses, family style. F sharing food is a great way to get lots of different samples of different dishes. There are cultures where it works really well. For example, in Greece and Turkey, they have a mezedis kind of uh, a way of eating where the assu assumption is that you're going to go and order a bunch of little dishes and everyone's going to share. But even in countries where that's a little less common, usually they're very forgiving of Americans who say, you know, can we order a couple of dishes and split them? In Italy, if you know uh, a magic word that might actually give you two different pastas on one plate, the magic word is bis, B-I-S. And a lot of restaurants will let you order pasta bis, meaning I want half a plate of this pasta and half a plate of this pasta. And they understand that you want to mix and match and try some different things. Don't be intimidated by European menus. Uh, honestly, some of the better places have menus that are only in one language, which can be intimidating. But oftentimes, the server speaks a little English, and they're happy to help you kind of sort through your choices. It's worth investing in a 
menu decoder, we have a series of Rick Steves guidebooks for several different languages. And the biggest part of our phrasebook is the menu decoder. We, I actually literally did the research for this where I went over to Europe and I walked from restaurant to restaurant for several days and I wrote down everything I saw in menus to make sure that we had all the words that are actually appearing on European menus. Um, that can really help avoid some of the confusion that you might have. There's also a lot of great online translating apps. I have the Google Translate app, which works great. Uh, it's a little less focused on menu decoding, uh, but it can certainly help you figure out what the basic ingredients are. My last tip, though, about uh, menu decoding and languages, uh, the language barrier when it comes to eating, uh, is don't let yourself be intimidated just because you don't know every single thing that's in that dish. Usually my goal is to figure out kind of what the main ingredient is. There's maybe one or two things that I want to kind of get a sense. Is this a fish? Is it a meat? Uh, what sort of am I roughly expecting? Uh, but at a certain point, you should take a leap of faith. I, I would say don't go into restaurants expecting to understand every aspect of every dish. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, service in European restaurants. And if you've been to Europe, you know that the way that Europeans expect to be served in restaurants is a little different than it is here. Uh, for one thing, a European service is very uh, relaxed. It's slow to an American standard. And the reason for that is, again, it's a philosophical adjustment. When Europeans go to a restaurant, dinner for a lot of people is the evening's entertainment. They're not trying to get a quick meal in before they go to the movies or go out dancing. They're there to really enjoy that restaurant. And so actually, rushed service is rude service to Europeans. So if you're ever in a restaurant and you have to basically stand up and wave your hand to get your waiter to come over to you, you might think, boy, this guy's ignoring me. I don't understand why. Well, the, understand, the understanding why is that uh, for Europeans, it would be rude if he kept coming over to you because you might feel rushed. Uh, and as you probably know, if you've been to Europe, you will never get the bill until you ask for the bill. And I have to say, this is really hard for Americans because you're done, you're ready to go, you've got places to be, and now you have to flag down the person to bring you your bill. Uh, but honestly, after I've been in Europe for a few weeks, and I come home, and I'm at an American restaurant, and I'm finishing the last bite of my food, and I see the bill land on the table, I'm a little bit offended, right? Are you trying to get rid of me? <laughs> and that's how Europeans think about this. So just be relaxed, be ready to spend a little extra time at restaurants, uh, and don't think that slow service is bad service. The other thing I want to talk about is tipping. Uh, Europeans, in general, are less generous tippers than Americans are, and it's really okay. I know that I'm not going to convince you all to start tipping 10%, uh, but I'm here to tell you Europeans usually tip 10% or less. It really is the case. I think in America we have um, this understanding that people usually get a minimum wage or lower for their base salary, and most of their salary comes from tips. In European cultures, it's a little bit different. Uh, tipping is, uh, is considered really optional. The person that's waiting on you actually receives a very healthy salary, and the tip is really just a bonus. Um, most Europeans would round up the bill, 5 or 10%. It's really just a convenience so that the server doesn't have to fish around for loose change. Um, that's kind of philosophically what tipping is. You know, honestly, a lot of countries, a lot of Europeans don't tip at all. I know that's hard for Americans. I usually tip somewhere between 5 and 10%. I sort of figure out what would 10% be, and then I maybe round it down a little bit to the nearest round number and that's plenty. Uh, it's just a very different philosophy than it is here.